welcome to the Hall of Philosophy and this special presentation, which is a product of a collaboration with our good friends at the Robert H. Jackson Center in Jamestown. Before I introduce John Q. Barrett, who will introduce our speaker this afternoon, I would make note of two items. First, I would ask you to uh, make sure that your cell phone is silenced. I don't believe mine is, so we'll do that now. Secondly, I would remind you that next week at Chautauqua, we'll be looking at the Supreme Court and its role in American life. We will have some extraordinarily talented scholars and practitioners and a leading journalist who covers the court here to look inside and out at the court, both in the morning in the amphitheater and in the Hall of Philosophy each afternoon. And next Wednesday evening, we'll be treated to a conversation with Chautauquan Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. If uh, you can't rearrange your travel plans to be here, if you're not planning to be, I would direct you to www.fora.tv um, after next week where all of these lectures will be available for you to watch uh, sitting in front of your computer. As I noted, this afternoon's program is in partnership with the Robert H. Jackson Center and is the sixth annual lecture in this series. John Barrett is the Elizabeth S. Lene Fellow at the Jackson Center. He's a graduate of Georgetown University and Harvard Law School and currently teaches at St. John's University. He is the editor of That Man, an insider's portrait of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Justice Jackson's previously unknown memoir of FDR, The New Deal. Professor Barrett is currently working on biography of Justice Jackson, which will provide the first insider's account of his year away from the Supreme Court, serving as Chief American Prosecutor at the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming back to Chautauqua a very good friend of this institution, John Barrett. It is always a pleasure to be back at Chautauqua. It's my honor to introduce this year's Chautauqua Institution Robert H. Jackson Lecture. As Jeff Follinsby said, the Jackson Lecture is now in its sixth year, and it combines three things that are classically Chautauqua. First, it is in the name of and in tribute to Robert H. Jackson, one of the leading, maybe the leading product of Chautauqua Institution, a man of this soil, of this region, who rose to the heights of the world stage and permanent, large historical significance. Secondly, the Jackson's lecture assembles excellent talent to address a vital topic. That's what Chautauqua is about. The topic of the annual Jackson lecture is the Supreme Court of the United States. And third, this lecture has timing. The summer season of Chautauqua falls, of course, shortly after the end of the Supreme Court's term, during its summer recess, an excellent opportunity to take stock in the court as an institution important to each of our lives. Of course, this summer particularly has timing because we have just completed a Supreme Court appointment summer. And so this lecture is a time to both look back and to look forward at the court. This year, in addition to those three qualities, the Jackson Lecture has a fourth thing going for it. It is, as Jeff mentioned, the ramp into next week's lecture theme, the Supreme Court of the United States. And I dare say that this afternoon's lecture is going to set a very high bar. Uh, in fact, it may be, in a premature way, the peak of next week's lectures. And I say that as, as one of next week's lecturers um, as we consider this topic. The past Jackson lecturers here at Chautauqua are an illustrious group. Professor Jeffrey Stone of the University of Chicago, Linda Greenhouse, the New York Times Supreme Court correspondent, Seth Waxman, the former Solicitor General of the United States, Jeff Tubin, author and writer, author of The Nine, and Paul Clement, another former Solicitor General of the United States. Today's lecturer, the sixth Jackson lecturer, Jeff Shessel, is in, in every way, that illustrious company. He's a graduate of Brown University. As a Rhodes Scholar, he attended and earned a graduate degree at Oxford University. He was a nationally syndicated cartoonist, Thatch, 
was the name of his cartoon. He was a, and is a, an accomplished historian. He wrote a, a wonderful book, not the topic of today's talk, but I encourage you, it's in the bookstore, uh, called Mutual Contempt, about the fraught relationship between Lyndon Johnson and Robert Kennedy. That book uh, earned much acclaim and a wide readership, but more importantly, it earned a select readership. It was read by Bill Clinton as President of the United States, which led him to send a mash note to Jeff Shessel, which led to a job offer, which led Jeff Shessel to become a Clinton speechwriter, 98, 99, and 2000, the last three years of the Clinton presidency. Following that experience in public service, Jeff and colleagues formed uh, an ongoing business in Washington called the West Wing Writers, uh, and they do speech writing and consulting, strategic advising to candidates and philanthropists and corporate institutions and others. And he has continued as a historian. In March, he published this book, Supreme Power, Franklin Roosevelt versus the Supreme Court, Kanaf. And it is a majestic, excellent book. It is the story of the court packing fight that was waged in response to President Franklin Roosevelt's proposal in the summer of 1937. It is a book about the Constitution. It is a book about democracy. It is a book about the presidency and the judiciary. And thus, obviously, it is not only historical, but it is contemporary. I hope you have seen the wide acclaim and glowing reviews that the book has earned. Alan Brinkley's review in the New York Times, a recent essay in The Nation. Uh, I dare say, and I hope sincerely, that this is a book that's about to win some very big awards. I met Jeff Shessel when he reviewed Justice Jackson's That Man in the New York Times. And his review, I'm sure, was part of that, the, the success that that book enjoyed. We then became friends, and of course had many topics of mutual interest. It has been an honor for me to be a, a kibitzer along the way as this thinking and research and writing became this book. And there are many points of mutual interest as I write about Justice Jackson because he was a player, not one of the leading, leading players, but a player as an assistant attorney general of the United States in 1937 in this court packing saga. So there is a Jackson role. There is also, uh, in a cameo sense, a Chautauqua Institution role. In the summer of 1937, the court packing summer, Jackson, then a third level official in the Department of Justice, the Attorney General, the Solicitor General, and then the Assistant Attorneys General, brought here as a VIP guest the Solicitor General, Stanley Reed. Jackson did that at the request of his dear friend, Dr. Arthur Bester, the president of Chautauqua Institution, as part of Jackson's very ongoing and sustained participation in the life and the riches of Chautauqua Institution during the decades where it was a big part of his life. And so Stanley Reed, the Solicitor General, DOJ number two, and Robert Jackson, DOJ number three, come here as the proposal and brainchild of DOJ number one and their ultimate boss, President number one, is being debated on the floor of the United States Senate. And this was the agenda. Reed came here on Thursday, July 8th, greeted by Bester, staying in the uh, Athenaeum with Mrs. Reed. And that Thursday evening was hosted for a dinner across the road in what was then called the Country Club. Uh, that is, you'll note, off the grounds. Uh, three big words, right, in Chautauqua understanding. Uh, Stanley Reed was a Kentuckian, and being off the grounds meant an opportunity for Chautauqua to host and welcome him and to celebrate some of the fine products of Reed's native Kentucky. <laughs> the guests on that Thursday evening were the judges and lawyers of this region, and I'm sure an interesting and wide-ranging, although unrecorded, discussion was part of the event. The next evening, Friday, uh, July 9th, Reed spoke in the amphitheater. He spoke not on court packing, at least not directly. He spoke on the topic of the future of states in the federal system. In other words, federalism. And he spoke from a 30-page text. Uh, Lord help us if he read it. It's not quite clear from the press accounts whether it was that kind of event. It's a very scholarly, very smart address by one of the people who was being discussed for a Supreme Court appointment. Had Roosevelt gotten all these seats, Reed probably was at the top of the short list. Introduced by Jackson, another person on that list, and lo and behold, although not through court packing, each does become a justice of the Supreme Court. 
But I was once advised by an excellent mentor, historian, teacher, and guide to do all the research and assemble all the facts, but then also don't be afraid to say and write what you know. And so I ask you if you agree with me, because I know that on that Thursday and on that Friday, Reed and Jackson and the lawyers and judges of this region and Bester talked a whole lot about court packing even if nobody ever put it on paper or put it in the Chautauqua Daily, had to be the case because it was America's topic of conversation. Now, Jeff Schessel will pick up, uh, in many ways, the dating mom as part of his lecture, but that backdrop gives, in addition to the Jackson lecture in the Supreme Court, a particular Chautauqua piece of continuity as we have this conversation about the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, that Supreme Court, the court packing proposal, and the importance to citizenry of what the Supreme Court means in our life. The 2010 Chautauqua Robert H. Jackson Lecturer on the Supreme Court of the United States, Jeff Schessel. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank my friend John for that very generous introduction. So generous, in fact, that Clearly, the safest route for me is to simply say thank you, good afternoon, and let you all go on to your next activity. Um, but uh, I, I feel that uh, this might disappoint John, uh, and uh, so I, I, will, um, I will carry through. And I thank all of you for coming out on this afternoon. Uh, I want you to know at the outset I do not have a 30-page text. I have merely a five-page text. Uh, and I want to be sure to leave room at the end uh, for uh, answering your questions and, and signing a few books. Uh, again, I, I want to thank John Barrett, uh, not just for uh, introducing me here today, but for introducing me to Robert Jackson and to a whole lot else, a whole range of ideas and characters, some of them uh, in the 1930s and, and some of them uh, still around today. Uh, John uh, facilitated uh, so much of my research in made so many introductions for me uh, that, uh, as the saying goes, this, this book uh, uh, bears uh, his influence, but uh, all of the mistakes uh, certainly must be my own. Um, I, I want to also thank Greg Peterson uh, of the Jackson Center and of Jamestown, who has invited me here um, uh, for his hospitality and for uh, introducing me to the Jackson Center, uh, showing me around uh, this morning, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, facility they have there and resource for this community. And uh, I want to thank Adam, Adam Braddon and, and the rest of the folks at, at the Jackson Center again uh, for sponsoring this lecture here today. I'm honored to be the first non-practitioner or non-Supreme Court correspondent to be invited to be, give this lecture. I am, as John mentioned, the first former cartoonist to give this lecture. <laughs> I hope that counts for something. Um, I've been running around uh, the country on my book tour happily impersonating a constitutional scholar uh, with uh, Justice O'Connor rumored to be on the ground somewhere. I fear that my long run has come to an end here today. Robert Jackson, as John indicated, played a, a role, a minor role, but in small ways an important one in Roosevelt's court packing fight. Uh, and more broadly in what Jackson, in his book on the subject, called the most dramatic and persistent rivalry in our history. The angry collision, as he put it, between conservative Supreme Court justices and progressive presidents, dating all the way back to Jefferson and Jackson and extending through Lincoln and both of the Roosevelts. Jackson watched with increasing concern and dismay as his president, his old friend Franklin Roosevelt, underwent one of the most dramatic reversals of presidential fortune in American history. Consider this. In January 1937, Franklin Roosevelt took the oath of office for the second time. He had been re-elected in 1936 by one of the greatest landslides in American history. It was a landslide not just for Roosevelt himself, but for the Democratic Party. The Senate in those days uh, consisted of 96 members for 48 states, of course, and out of those 96 senators who were seated in January of 1937, 76 of the 96 were Democrats. And not all of the remaining 20 were Republicans. Uh, 
the, the United States was closer to one party rule than it had been since Reconstruction. And one senator at the time uh, de declared that, in his words, if the president asked Congress to commit suicide tomorrow, we'd do it. That was the sense of Roosevelt's power at the beginning of 1937. Six months later, he had suffered the most spectacular defeat of his political life. The New Deal was stalled, his popularity was undergoing its steepest decline, and a new conservative coalition was emerging in the Congress, particularly in the Senate, not only of these few Republicans, but more importantly of conservative Democrats, who had always been opposed, always been opposed to the New Deal, but had voted for it uh, out of loyalty or fear or some combination of the two, and were now joining with Republicans to defy the president increasingly. The Saturday Evening Post wrote at this point, at the end of the summer of 1937, shortly after Stanley Reed and, and Robert Jackson took the stage here at Chautauqua, that FDR commands support, but not the old awe, reverence, or idolatry. So what happened in that six-month period? These were the six months, as John indicated, of the court fight, as it was known at the time, the court packing fight, as we refer to it today. And what drew me to this story is not simply that it was a monumental clash, but that it was a monumental clash that, in my view, had never really been fully explained. It's mentioned, of course, all over the place in any standard account of the period, in any biography of Franklin Roosevelt. You can't overlook the court fight. But too often, I found the, the court fight had been reduced to a, a neat, pat parable of presidential overreach. Usually, uh, it is a morality play in which a second term president overreads his mandate and overreaches. Now there's an element to that, but it never seemed to me to suffice to say that in his first term there's this wonderful Franklin Roosevelt, the skilled politician who all of us know and many of us love, and then he was reelected and he simply lost his head and for six months went kind of nuts and proposed to do this crazy thing which was to pack the court. Then he lost and then he went back to being the Roosevelt that we all know and most of us love. Does that really happen? And that was the one of the first questions that I wanted to answer in my own research in, in the book that I ultimately wrote. I came to feel that the answer to this question was, was key to understanding not only Roosevelt, but his times as well. This really was the defining conflict of his presidency in the years before World War II, this conflict with the conservatives on the Supreme Court and in the country. And the stakes, as both sides saw it, were nothing less than the survival of democracy. Roosevelt and his supporters felt that if he could not find a way to deal with the Depression, if he could not get the Supreme Court to validate these programs to provide relief for the unemployed, to provide Social Security for the elderly, if he could not get the Supreme Court to validate the idea of workers' rights and of collective bargaining and so forth, that there would be a total economic collapse in this country that would make the Depression look like a cakewalk. And out of the ashes would rise a dictator as everyone knew was happening in Europe. Now the conservatives on the court and the conservatives in the country saw it very differently, but again, they saw the states in similarly apocalyptic terms. They felt that if Roosevelt was able to centralize power in Washington to the extent that he wanted to do, if he was able to pass these programs that would, in their view, regiment American life uh, in ways that uh, no president or no Congress had ever done before, that he would be extinguishing liberty in this country, the liberty that rested on property rights and on the, the limits that the Constitution creates on governmental power. Now, if any of this sounds familiar, it's because, I believe, uh, the, the court packing fight is useful in understanding our own times as well. I, I don't believe that history repeats itself exactly, but I do think that it echoes itself, sometimes very loudly, and this may be one of those times. If you go back to the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court, the campaign finance decision at the beginning of this year, and you'll be hearing a lot about that next week, uh, the uh, suits by the attorneys general of various states against the health care plan, some of the arguments that we heard during the hearings over the Kagan nomination, it's clear that this argument, the argument between Roosevelt and the Supreme Court, which really is the argument between Jefferson and Hamilton and Jefferson and Marshall. Jefferson had a lot of arguments. It's a fundamental argument, an unsettled argument in American history over the meaning of the Constitution and its provisions, over the limits of governmental power.
over the question of whether democracy can be made to work in times of severe economic distress. And in times of distress, that's when this question, which is always simmering, becomes explosive. And when you look around and read the coverage about the Tea Party, and you see that the Tea Party is at its rallies handing out pocket-sized copies of the Constitution, like party favors, that it is offering weekend classes in the Constitution, rather like Bible study, and that its leading lights, Rand Paul and others, have suggested that the way to balance the federal budget is simply to eliminate every program that is not expressly authorized by the Constitution. That means Social Security out, Medicare out, student financial aid out, disabilities, uh, di disability insurance out. And you see that this is indeed a very live argument. Perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about that in the Q&A. But I want to begin by painting a picture of the antagonists in this fight, beginning with Franklin Roosevelt. Now, he is someone we all know, and I'm not going to try to introduce him as a character to you, but I do want to speak about Roosevelt in one particular regard, and that is Roosevelt as a lawyer. Now, it's possible that not everybody here knows that Roosevelt was a lawyer, and Roosevelt would be very happy for that. <laughs> Roosevelt was not in love with the law. He was not in love with lawyers. Um, he, the, the bar at that point was a very conservative force in American life. He felt that it was detached from American life, in fact. And uh, he was, in fact, early in his career, a practicing lawyer briefly before he entered politics, as he always intended to do. Uh, but as Robert Jackson observed about Roosevelt, he did not really like the judicial process with its slow movement. He wanted shortcuts. He was an executive personality. He liked to get things done. And he thought chiefly in terms of right and wrong. And as Jackson pointed out in the memoir that is now Batman, uh, Roosevelt tended to believe that if it was right, it was probably constitutional. <laughs> now, this is a dangerous proposition. But I should hasten to point out that Roosevelt did have a fairly sophisticated understanding of the Constitution and where the argument about the Constitution was in the 1920s and 1930s. He believed in something called the living Constitution, back when liberals weren't afraid to admit such things. He believed in the Constitution of Holmes, of Brandeis, of Cardozo, a Constitution that has enduring principles uh, that were etched by the founders but that need to be adapted in their application to the changes in modern life, which seemed fairly straightforward, but it was not necessarily a majority opinion in the country at the time. Neither is, is it a majority opinion in the country at this time. Roosevelt believed, in his words, that the Constitution was, quote, the most marvelously elastic set of rules ever devised. And he also believed that there was nothing in the Constitution ultimately that prevented the federal government from doing what it needed to do. As Robert Jackson put it, in the struggle for judicial supremacy, the Constitution contemplated a really effective government. The founders had been through the experience of the Articles of Confederation, and their goal was to make democracy succeed. That was Roosevelt's mantra. And so he saw no contradiction between his plans for the New Deal and the Constitution. But he saw a clash coming with the conservatives in the Supreme Court. He did not expect them to agree with him. He hoped that by the time the New Deal cases made their inevitable path to the Supreme Court, that the New Deal programs would have so entrenched themselves in American life that the court would think twice about overturning them. And this was an open question. And it was a question that preoccupied observers between 1933 and 1935 before the first New Deal cases were really considered. The other protagonist, or I should say antagonist, in this, in this drama were the justices of the Supreme Court, known collectively at that time and rather cruelly as the Nine Old Men. This was, in fact, the oldest Supreme Court in American history. And among liberals, there was a general belief that age informed outlook. They tended to ignore or purposefully overlook the fact that the oldest member of that Supreme Court was Brandeis. And Brandeis was, in many ways, uh, the liberal leading light of that Supreme Court. Uh, but generally, uh, there was the sense that these were not simply old men, but they were outdated in their views. They were 19th century men. Willis Van Deventer, one of the four conservatives on the court, known collectively as the Four Horsemen, Van Deventer was old enough to remember having seen Lincoln's funeral procession. 
as a child. George Sutherland, who was the intellectual leader of the Conservatives on the court, was born in England before either Gladstone or Disraeli had served as Prime Minister. So these were 19th century men, not only in age, but in outlook. Not all of them, but many of them. And they believed in a, a constitution of limitations in the phrase of the late 19th century. And this was a court that had been a powerfully conservative force in the nation for a half century by the time President Roosevelt took office. Many of these Gilded Age legal doctrines of the, the, the late 19th century still prevail um, on the court of the 1920s and the 1930s, despite the changes in American life and despite the realities of the Depression. Now, the leader of this court was Charles Evans Hughes, who was really one of the greatest uh, towering figures ever to serve on the Supreme Court, and he looked the part. In fact, uh, many observers over the years likened Hughes to God himself. Joe, Zeus, the, the metaphors uh, were, were often made. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a different name for, for Hughes, which was the bearded iceberg. <laughs> Hughes was a passionate man, but he kept that very much in check. In public and on the court, he was very cool. He was very much in control. Hughes had been a, a reform-minded governor of New York in the era of Teddy Roosevelt. He had served essentially as a liberal justice on the Supreme Court from 1910 to 1916, left the court that year to run against Wilson, and came within a few thousand votes of beating Wilson in California. If he had won California, Hughes would have beaten uh, Wilson as president. He then became Secretary of State during the Republican administrations in the 1920s, became the leading corporate lawyer in America, and in 1930 he was brought back by Hoover to serve as Chief Justice. He was a commanding presence, except he could not control this court. It was a court that was terribly divided. It was divided not right down the middle, but there were three liberals. I've mentioned uh, one or two of them already, Brandeis, Cardozo, and Harlan Fisk Stone, who was a Republican appointee, but a deep believer in judicial restraint, a deep believer in the idea that the Congress and Roosevelt should be entitled to make most every mistake that they wanted to make. And on the right, you had the four horsemen who I mentioned. I mentioned Van de Manter, and uh, I mentioned uh, 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 George Sutherland. There's also Pierce Butler and uh, James McReynolds, who was really the id of the conservatives on the court. A vicious anti-Semite and probably the most disagreeable man ever to serve on the court. Uh, the talk was that, that McReynolds, who had been Wilson's attorney general, was so disagreeable in cabinet meetings that Wilson kicked him upstairs to the Supreme Court where he wouldn't bother anybody but the other eight men. This was a court without a center, and Hughes, for all his power and all his brilliance, was unable to bring this court together, not only over socioeconomic questions, but over the judiciary's role in a democracy, and exactly how often the court ought to be exercising its powers of judicial review to overturn acts of Congress, to overturn the social and economic experiments of the states. And so, inevitably, at the beginning of 1935, the court begins to outlaw the New Deal, it begins, in the words of one Republican newspaper, to, quote, throw this revolutionary nonsense into the Potomac where it belongs. And in May 1935, it overturns the NRA, the National Recovery Administration, one of the centerpieces of the New Deal. In January 1936, it overturns the AAA, the agricultural program in its entirety. It knocks down the Coal Act. It knocks down the Railroad Pensions Act. It knocks down minimum uh, municipal Bankruptcy Act, it knocks down state minimum wages, and everybody assumes, on left and right, that Social Security and the National Labor Relations Act are next. And it's not only the Supreme Court, but in fact the entire federal judiciary. In 1935 alone, district courts issued more than 1,600 injunctions halting enforcement of New Deal laws. It was not just the fact of these decisions, but it was the tone of these decisions that caused grave concern in the White House and among New Dealers. McReynolds, uh, who generally would write a perfunctory dissent but deliver an extemporaneous one from the bench, said it, there was one case in 1935 that went in Roosevelt's favor, 5-4. It was the Gold Clause cases, which uh, settled the monetary policy of the administration. And McReynolds, in dissent from the bench, put down his text and he said, the Constitution as we know it is gone. This is Nero at his worst. And so as, as bad as things get uh, these days, it is actually still hard to imagine Justice Scalia saying something like that. <laughs> in fact, 
judicial restraint. <laughs> Sutherland, in his more muted way, wrote in, in one of his opinions at the time that the Depression was nothing new and that the fix could not possibly be legislation, but in his words, self-denial and painful effort on the part of the unemployed. And so by the end of the 1935-1936 term, the one columnist likened uh, the, the American landscape to the stage at the end of a Shakespeare tragedy. The body, the stage is strewn with dead bodies. And the dead bodies, of course, were the New Deal programs. Roosevelt himself said that the court had created a no man's land in which no one could govern, not the federal government, not the states. And so during this period, it shouldn't surprise us that the Justice Department, under the leadership of Homer Cummings, who John mentioned, began what Cummings called simply a project of great importance. And that was to figure out what to do about the Supreme Court. The country at this point was very engaged in this fight, which played out for great stakes on the front pages of the paper. And the country became, in 35 and 36, something like a, a rolling constitutional convention. And just about every solution under the sun was kicked around in the press and the town hall meetings and so forth. And the most popular resort was constitutional amendments. And dozens, even hundreds of them, were being proposed, not only just uh, sitting around in town hall meeting, but by members of Congress. And these, uh, these amendments ran the gamut from uh, being fairly simple, term limits or age limits for Supreme Court justices, to being radical reshiftings of the balance of the federal power. For example, a popular idea was that Congress, by a two-thirds vote, ought to be able to essentially overrule the Supreme Court. They didn't like the decision. Congress votes it down two-thirds, and Congress, rather than the court, becomes the last word on the Constitution. A very popular idea. Another one was to suggest that the Supreme Court couldn't overrule an act of Congress uh, by anything less than a 7-2 margin. Six, three, five, four decisions no longer count. The statute would be upheld. Uh, others suggested uh, that certain critical areas of policy should be stripped from the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Social and economic policy, strip it. So the court can't even consider those cases. All of these were considered very carefully by the Justice Department and reviewed. 65-page memos were being produced within the Justice Department considering all of these possibilities in all of their permutations and all of their potential consequences. They were all reviewed by Roosevelt and one after another rejected over the course of 1936. He rejected them for two reasons. One, as I said before, he did not feel that there was any fundamental conflict between the Constitution and the New Deal. He didn't think really there was anything wrong with the Constitution. He thought these were all devices and might do more damage to the fabric of the Constitution um, than, than uh, improving it in any way. Secondly, as a practical politician, he felt that it was very impractical to try to amend the Constitution. It had been done. It had been done recently, but not about anything quite as contentious about this, except uh, after the Supreme Court in 1918 overturned a federal ban on child labor, there was a big push to amend the Constitution to ban child labor. And despite the momentum it had for a period of time, that sputtered out. Roosevelt didn't think he could get any amendment through or get it through quickly enough to make a difference. So for that same reason, he rejected waiting. One Democratic senator told Roosevelt in 1936, sensing his impatience, he said, Father Time is on your side. Let's remember, this is the oldest court in American history. <laughs> but Roosevelt knew that James McReynolds had said, and I quote, I'll never retire so long as that crippled son of a bitch is in the White House. <laughs> and he really, feel, he really felt that these guys would hang in there to the very last. And he didn't feel that he had much time. There was a wave of sit-down strikes, as many of you may know. There was a wave of, of violent sit-down strikes sweeping across the country beginning in earnest in 1936 and really accelerating into 1937. Such that one commentator, one legal commentator, looking at the National Labor Relations Act cases, the Wagner Act cases as they were known, said that the Supreme Court, when it wrote its decision, would write it either in blood or in ink. And it was up to the Supreme Court. And there really was the sense that if the Supreme Court struck down the Wagner Act, that there would be violence in the streets, that there would be federal officials with machine guns standing on the streets. 
And this was not a fantastical notion. As I said, there was violence, there were shootings, there were beatings happening in factories across the country. So Roosevelt didn't feel that he could wait much longer. He waited for the entirety of his first term. And so at the beginning of his second term, after his landslide re-election, he settled on a solution that had been in the air, but had always been discounted by Roosevelt and by others, and that was packing the court. To give you a little bit of history on packing the court, uh, there is, as many of you know, there is no number nine in the Constitution. The founders didn't mandate that there should be nine Supreme Court justices. In fact, they didn't set a number at all. They believed that the court would need to expand as the nation expanded and as the business of the nation increased. Lord Bryce, who came in the 19th century and, and wrote a, a book on the American Commonwealth, said that in his words, this was, quote, a weak point, a joint in the armor through which a weapon might someday penetrate. And Bryce knew that, in fact, that had happened before. And the size of the Supreme Court had gone up and down over the course of the 19th century. The court began at six, and John Adams, when the Federalists lost uh, the election in 19, uh, of 1800, John Adams and the Federalists promptly eliminated a Supreme Court seat pending the next retirement, just so that Thomas Jefferson wouldn't have the chance to appoint anybody anytime soon. This happened again in 1866 uh, under Andrew Johnson. And uh, seats had been added uh, to help Lincoln during the war. Uh, that court went up to 10. So it had gone up and down, and it had settled at 9 under Grant in 1869. And it, by 1937, it had been at 9 ever since. So it had a feeling of permanence. And Roosevelt, because he didn't want to be drawn into the issue before he was ready, didn't talk about it during the 36 campaign, didn't prepare the public for what he was thinking about doing. He crafted the plan in secret with Homer Cummings, and none of the inner circle knew about it at this point. Not Robert Jackson, not Stanley Reed, until it was quite too late. What they came up with was what Roosevelt and Cummings believed, believed was a very clever plan, and that was that you couldn't force the conservatives off the court, but what you could do was outnumber them. And so they came up with a device to say that for every justice, 70 or older, who refused to retire, the president would have the right to appoint a new justice, to essentially sit beside the old justice and help him with his work. <laughs> they were very taken with the cleverness of this plan, and they didn't run it by any of their advisors, probably because they didn't want to be disabused of this notion that it was, in fact, very clever, and would give Roosevelt six appointees overnight if none of the justices retired. They sort of reluctantly set a ceiling of 15 justices on the Supreme Court, so it wouldn't go any higher than that. And so on February 5th, 1937, Roosevelt unveiled his plan to America. Not only to America, but he unveiled his plan in a series of very short meetings that morning to the leadership of Congress, to his own cabinet, and then he was wheeled into the Oval Office where he read it to the reporters. And it was a shock to everyone involved. And in fact, after he had brought in the congressional leadership, they got in their cars to go back to Capitol Hill, feeling uh, very dejected um, by the notion that they were going to have to carry this through the Congress for Roosevelt. And the head of the, the chair of the, of the House Judiciary Committee turned to his colleagues and said, boys, here's where I cash my chips. He was done. He would not support it. He indicated this uh, on the ride back to Capitol Hill. And when they got there, and when the court packing message and the piece of legislation were read to the Senate, first the, the rest of the Senate was hearing of this, John Nance Garner, the Vice President, who was effectively the Senate Majority Leader, he was so beloved on Capitol Hill, stood in the well of the Senate, held his nose, and gestured thumbs down. It was an incitement to revolution. And that is what Roosevelt got. There was huge momentum in the Congress to do something about the court. There was a lot of momentum for these constitutional amendments. There was a great desire to get the New Deal through and to do something about the court, but not this. And they resented, frankly, that Roosevelt had not consulted them on this, had not sought their ideas, and now he was expecting them. He had actually drafted the legislation for them and expected them to carry it through. And so the plan, as one of Roosevelt's advisors later put it, began with a black eye. And the case that Roosevelt was making, the idea that this was all about judicial efficiency, that the court was behind on its work because these were old men after all, was an incomplete case, it was a misleading case, it was flat out untrue, and it was easily disproven by the Justice Department's own numbers. 
This happened within 24 hours of the unveiling of the plan. It was wholly discredited, and Roosevelt's motives in keeping this secret and in crafting this false rationale were called very much into question. No one bought the picture that Roosevelt had painted of congested court dockets and aged justices refusing to hear important cases, denying writs of certiorari in the language of the law. And in late February, Robert Jackson traveled to Jamestown, and he found FDR's natural supporters to be, in Jackson's words, baffled by the court plan. Roosevelt had not done enough to prepare them. He had not done enough to persuade them. And Jackson went back to Washington and wrote FDR a letter, giving him the, the sort of blunt, even harsh assessment that he was not getting from any of his other advisors. He wrote the president, quote, I have returned from some time among the plain people and regret to report to you that support for your court reform is decreasing. This, I think, is distinctly due to the terms in which the problem is approached. The general public do not know what certiorari is. They do not understand calendar congestion. And Jackson urged Roosevelt to make the case more simply and clearly, and in his words, to seize the fighting issues, how the court had made itself a super legislature, how the conservative justices had gone out of their way to cut off every avenue for social and economic reform, how they were twisting the meaning of the Constitution. Jackson wrote FDR that the people are unquestionably ready to support you to the finish if they understand that this is the fight to make the court a contemporary and nonpartisan institution. I am utterly unable to get any response to the statistical approach, and I do not see that anyone else has. FDR had rejected this advice earlier when it counted the most, but after three weeks of being battered in the press, he was finally ready to embrace it, and in a White House meeting that followed with Jackson and Stanley Reed, he was surprisingly quick to yield and admitted, it is a pretty terrible platform to stand on, isn't it? He recognized that he had made a huge error in judgment, and so he resolved to do what he should have done from the start, which was to make the case plainly, to take the fight directly to the court, and to put the real issue before the American people. Interestingly, it might not have been too late at that point, and this, in my research, was one of the biggest surprises about the court packing fight. It's generally assumed to have been doomed on day one. As I said, it began with a black eye. But the public was evenly split. There was a lot of loyalty to Roosevelt. There was a lot of sympathy for the New Deal. And two thirds of the public, according to Gallup, believed that the Supreme Court should be issuing more liberal decisions. And so throughout this fight, although public support for the plan declined steadily, it didn't decline by much. We're talking a point or two in the polls. And most seasoned observers, starting with Roosevelt himself, believed that in the end he would win. So much so that the papers were filled with speculation about who was going to be named in these six seats. Many of these names actually did wind up getting appointed. Robert Jackson, Stanley Reed, Felix Frankfurter. And many who said later that they'd seen the writing on the wall from the beginning believed at the time that FDR would win. And it's easy to understand why uh, later, people said that the writing was on the wall because Roosevelt, after beginning in this terrible fashion, suffered a series of incredible reversals. Uh, uh, among them, the Chief Justice, Charles Evans Hughes, who I mentioned, uh, put out some feelers suggesting to the leaders of the Senate opposition that he might actually like to testify against the plan. Brandeis told the Chief this was probably not a good idea for the court to inject itself. Uh, in political controversy in this way. So Brandeis and Hughes came up with the idea that they would write a letter, that Hughes would write a letter to the leader of the Senate opposition. He would ask, they, they reached out to Burt Wheeler, the Senate Democrat who was leading the, the opposition, and said, Senator Wheeler, would you be interested in a letter from the Chief Justice commenting on the validity of uh, this plan? And Wheeler felt this was a gift from heaven and said, well, why, why, yes, I would. And so Wheeler wrote a letter to Hughes asking for his views. Hughes then, over a weekend, produced uh, an incredibly powerful letter, taking apart this notion already discredited that the court was behind on its work. That was devastating to the court plan. But more devastating to the court plan was the fact that in the middle of this fight, in the spring of 1937, the court switched. Specifically, one justice switched, Owen Roberts, who was the justice in the middle. He's the justice I didn't mention, because he didn't line up neatly with either the liberals or conservatives. He had, in fact, gone back and forth. But he had increasingly aligned himself during those New Deal cases, vehemently, in fact, with the conservatives. Most liberals thought that Roberts was lost. But here, in the spring of 1937, 
Suddenly, Roberts votes to uphold a minimum wage act that was virtually identical in every respect to the one he had voted to knock down less than a year ago. And then a couple of weeks later, he joins with Hughes and the liberals to uphold the Wagner Act, a sweeping piece of legislation. What a day, Robert Jackson wrote. The court was on the march. Roberts had yielded. He would always deny it, but he, had, he would always insist that his positions on the two minimum wage cases were actually consistent, even if the results were different. But no one believed him, and I would count myself in that crowd. Then in swift succession, in May of 1937, Justice Van Deventer, one of the conservatives, announced that he would retire. This was carefully timed in order to pull the last leg out from under the, the Supreme Court plan, and Social Security was upheld. Even then, even then, Roosevelt could have had two justices or four justices added to the court if he'd been willing to compromise. And we would have a court of 11 or 13 today, even then. But until the very last, he refused to compromise. Until the heat of the summer of 1937, just before future justices Reed and Jackson made their trip up here, he finally, Roosevelt finally yielded to the advice of the Senate Majority Leader, Joe Robinson, this old bull of an Arkansan whose desperate hope uh, was to wind up on the Supreme Court someday, and who had been promised more or less publicly by Roosevelt that he would. Robinson convinced Roosevelt that it was either two justices or nothing. Roosevelt finally gave in and powered Robinson to seek her compromise. Robinson, at the beginning of July 1937, opened the Senate debate on the bill, stood at the podium, at the mahogany podium, pounding his fist, shouting it at uh, the opposition on the floor and in the galleries, in the galleries and turns purple, collapses on the floor. He's carried outside to the veranda where they fan him and give him a glass of milk. He's sent home to rest, and that's where he's found dead the next morning, on the floor holding a copy of the congressional record. With Robinson dies any hope of a compromise. Now Roosevelt, for the rest of his life, insisted in his words, we lost the battle, but we won the war. Failed to pack the court, but the court switched, and in fact never went back. It never rejected another New Deal program after that point. This was the Constitutional Revolution of 1937, as it's known today. But really, it took some time for that revolution to be waged. And the court, which changed in that moment in 1937, was transformed by Roosevelt's appointees. I mentioned Jackson, Frankfurter, and Reed, and also Hugo Black, who was the first of those appointees, and others. And in any event, this was a very costly victory for Roosevelt. Alan Brinkley, in his book, The End of Reform, cites this moment as the beginning of the end of reform, because this conservative coalition that Roosevelt helped to create in Congress. There had always been conservatives in Congress, but they hadn't felt confident enough to defy Roosevelt. Now they did. And the relationships that they forged across the aisle would continue to stymie Roosevelt for the rest of his presidency. And eventually, these Southern Democrats, who now align themselves with Republicans, became Republicans. Some of them in the 40s and the 50s, and the last of them really in the 60s and 70s after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So it was a costly victory. And it was also, it was an enduring one for many decades, but ultimately a temporary one. Most observers today see this Supreme Court as the most conservative in decades. Many of you may have seen the New York Times front page story a few Sundays ago, uh, and they had a helpful chart when you opened up the story. Uh, they put all of the Supreme Court justices, since a certain point on grading, ranking them from liberal to conservative. And you see that the four horsemen of the apocalypse, as they were known at the time, are in the middle of the pack. And on the far right of this chart are Justices Scalia, Roberts, Thomas, Alito. So this was a victory that endures, as I said, in many ways, but is in jeopardy today. And the lessons are always in danger of being unlearned by both presidents and Supreme Court justices. For President Obama, who, as you know, took a shot at the Supreme Court in the State of the Union address, there is a risk, as Roosevelt found, in personalizing a conflict with justices who, after all, have the last word on the Constitution. For the court, there is always a danger in what Hughes once called self-inflicted wounds. 
The least democratic branch, as it's sometimes known, has to be ever mindful of public opinion. And right now, it's unclear where public opinion is on the court. There was a poll last month done for the Aspen Institute that indicated that the public is more open to changing the structure of the judicial branch than either of the other branches. You would think that with all the bad press the filibuster has gotten, that people would be very open to ending the filibuster. They're not. But 69% of the public favors a mandatory retirement age for Supreme Court justice. 66% favor, favor term limits. And by a margin of 51 to 34, they favor the popular election of Supreme Court justices. Now, I'm not going to predict that any of these things are going to happen. In fact, I will confidently predict that none of these things will happen. But it is an indication that there is some dis dissatisfaction with the court, not just on the left right now, but also on the right. I think everybody's probably unhappy with the court right now. Either way, the, the argument's not over. And as Robert Jackson later concluded, quote, the struggle for judicial supremacy has produced no permanent reconciliation between the principles of representative government and the opposing principle of judicial authority. And Roosevelt agreed. We won the war, he said, in 1937. But he knew that each successive generation, standing on the foundation that he built, would have to wage and win that war for itself. Thank you. biographical sketch. Um, he was the son of a hardware merchant in Philadelphia. Um, he went to the University of Pennsylvania undergraduate and for law school and was a star student. He was such a star at the law school that uh, immediately upon his graduation he was asked to begin teaching there. And uh, he was uh, well loved, um, had a very strong, powerful presence. He had a photographic memory and he could argue any case uh, without notes. Uh, he was remarkable in the court and became really a fixture in Republican life in Philadelphia, which at the time was a very Republican city. And uh, one of his friends from Penn was Senator Pepper. And when Calvin Coolidge was looking for somebody to investigate the Teapot Dome scandal of the Harding administration, they, Pepper recommended Roberts, and Roberts did an excellent job and won a prosecution, prosecution of uh, Albert Fall. And he uh, was uh, generally appreciated by both Republicans and Democrats. And uh, when one of Hoover's nominees for the court failed in 1930, uh, Judge John Parker, when that was knocked down by the progressives in the Senate, uh, Hoover brought forward Owen Roberts, uh, who was instantly accepted by both sides in the debate. And both sides felt that he might be on their side, ultimately. And many of those who knew Roberts very well, though he was identified as Republican, were really uncertain what kind of justice he would be. And so there, there was a lot of hope that he'd be a great progressive or a great conservative. And he was both of those things. Um, and uh, Stone, uh, 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 Harlan Fisk Stone, expressed some concern in, in letters a few years later that no one on the court really knows where Roberts is. But after the New Deal, when the New Deal cases came before the court, as I said before, Roberts very strongly aligned himself with the conservatives. And he wrote two of the most vehement anti-New Deal decisions at the time, including the, the majority opinion that knocked down the AAA, heaping scorn upon the very notions of these legislation, uh, these pieces of legislation. And so there was the sense that he had been lost forever, as I said earlier. But Roberts is a very interesting case, and he was the youngest of these men on the Supreme Court. He was 60, he was very active, in Washington life. Uh, he was sort of the only man about town that was on the Supreme Court. And uh, he was uh, so beloved by many people that they had begun to talk about him as a potential challenger to Roosevelt in 1936. It's not clear that he really took this that seriously, but he didn't mind the talk. And you can judge that by the fact that there was similar talk about Stone, who instantly killed the rumors. Roberts let the rumors kind of go for a while. Um, and it was Roberts who cared enough about what people thought that um, he really suffered in 1936 when the court knocked down the New York State minimum wage uh, in probably the most controversial decision of the entire period. And the liberal animus focused on Roberts. In the same way that the liberal animus today focuses on Justice Kennedy, not on Thomas, you know which way Thomas is going to vote. But if you're a liberal, you kind of hope maybe you might swing Kennedy. And so there had been some hope through early in this period that Roberts 
would go with the liberals. But by this point, as I said, it was clear that he was lost, and he suffered terrible, terrible scorn. And so there is some indication that he was looking for a shot at redemption. And so later that fall, only a few months later, another minimum wage case came before the justices. And they had to consider first whether they were going to hear the case. The conservatives in conference said, forget it, we just decided this. We decided in very, very clear terms. Yet Roberts voted with the liberals to hear the case. And there was some murmuring in the conference room. One of the conservatives said to another, what's the matter with Roberts? And what was the matter with Roberts was that he had suffered very badly. Now, I don't think you can say any of this with certainty. And Roberts in later years insisted, as I said, that his position on these two cases could be squared. But when you read the long memo that he wrote making that argument, it's very easy to take apart, which is something that I try to do in the book. And you can see whether you find my position on this uh, 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 persuasive. Uh, I am not going to stand here, and I'm not going to uh, sit in front of my book and say that I figured out what Andy Roberts uh, decided as he did. All you can do is you can lay out the facts, um, and you can lay out what you know and what other people said about Roberts. And I think it seems clear that the weight of the evidence is that he was looking for a shot at a redemption. He saw one, and he took it. And in fact, um, there's a study uh, that's either just come out or is just about to come out by uh, someone at a law school who's done a comprehensive study of all of, of uh, Robert's decisions. And there's a strong conservative trend with some aberrations, pre-court fight, then suddenly you have a liberal spike, and then he goes back to being conservative. And one of the reasons that Roosevelt kept fighting after the switch in time that saved nine, as it was known, is that he didn't believe for a second that Roberts was a liberal to stay. And in fact, he was right about that. But it turned out not to matter, because by that point, Roosevelt had the opportunity to appoint Black to ban democracy and permanently tip the court in a liberal direction. Same. Comes out of the speech writer or out of his group. Uh, what part did each of you play? And I've always been curious about it. You're the first guy I've ever had a chance to dump that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Uh, I, it depends on the president you're writing for. Um, and uh, writing for Bill Clinton, um, you didn't go in with any expectation that he would necessarily say what you gave him. Generally, what he would do, uh, if you were doing your job right and you were running the process right, um, is that he would deliver probably three quarters of the text that you gave him. And then he would add, he would double that with his own observations and comments in the margin or extemporaneous uh, comments. Um, and given that, and given what a brilliant extemporaneous speaker Bill Clinton is, it changes the way you write speeches. I've written speeches for certainly hundreds of people in the 10 years since I left the White House. And uh, very often, um, you work closely with them to get a sense of the way they think um, so that you can write in, in their voice and capture the ideas of uh, the speaker and their organization, their goals, and so forth, and get those on the page. And most of them will then take it and go up and they will read from it as you wrote it, as long as it's consistent with their ideas. Um, but when you're writing for Bill Clinton, or somebody like Bill Clinton, who's great um, uh, extemporaneously, um, it changes the way you write. Because if you write a tightly bound speech that commits the speaker to everything that's on the page, um, then uh, when he breaks free of it, as he inevitably will, he's never going to come back. And when a president speaks, there are certain things that the president needs to say if there's a policy that he's unveiling. And, you know, uh, Bill Clinton's going to get around to saying these things, but he may not say them in the perfectly calibrated way that you and his chief of staff and his senior political advisors and everybody else, policy advisors, think that he needs to say it. And so what we tried to do as speechwriters um, to account for that was to really focus on the structure of the argument. And we always said, you're not writing a speech, you're building an argument. The president's not just standing up here to impress everybody, make them cry. Sometimes that was what he was doing. But, um, but he was standing up to persuade and to advance certain goals and positions. And so you would write a speech that was very carefully structured so that the scenes in it were apparent to him. And so a speaker who's as gifted as Bill Clinton would hold the page in front of him, and he has a classic move, and now I'm giving away his secrets. He'll go like this, like he's thinking about something. And what he's doing is he's essentially memorizing the page of text. And he looks up and he says, let me tell you something. 
And, you know, he can do that without a note on it. You know, he doesn't need that page. But he will read the page, he will absorb it. And he, if he knows where he is in the course of the speech, then he can riff off the page like a jazz musician and then find his way back in seamlessly so that nobody, sometimes even the speech writer, knows when he left the page and you know, when, when he came back. And so it's a remarkable thing. There's no one else, as I said, I've written for uh, at least a couple hundred people in 10 years since, and nobody can do that. Um, but it did teach me a lot about how to account for speakers who are very gifted. Um, and uh, you know, there are certainly many of those, if not too many who are as gifted as, as President Clinton. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Do you have a uh, Supreme Court justice that is kind of a hero to you, who's left a legacy that uh, I think is kind of unknown in some respects? I mean, my favorite is, of course, Robert Jackson, because I'm from here. But, uh, I'd like to know if you uh, have felt something there and that is carried on in part of your intellectual life that has been a founding, kind of founding father for that. Well, thank you. I, I, will, um, I will say for the record, Robert Jackson. Um, and I'm not trying to be cute about it. Um, I, I think Jackson is a hero in, 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 in so many regards. Um, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't be being honest if I, if I started with Jackson because, as I said, I'm a relative latecomer uh, to Robert Jackson. Uh, as John and I both mentioned, I really came to Jackson through that man um, and through the court packing fight. Uh, I, I think for me, um, it's, it's Benjamin Cardozo who was such a quiet force on that court, and whose, whose classic text, The Nature of the Judicial Process, um, says most of what you would want to know about the act of judging and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the obligations of a judge who believes that the Constitution is essentially a living creation, that it is something that need, the ter interpretation needs to evolve. But at the same time, wants to anchor him or herself in the core principles of the Constitution and, and in precedent and so forth. Because once you free yourself from, to a certain degree, of the, from the text or the intent of the founders to the extent that, that we know it, what is it that binds you at all? And that, of course, is the argument that Scalia and others uh, have made uh, very successfully, that it just leaves the judge to decide whatever he wants. Well, it doesn't. And I think, you know, you don't need to go any farther than this great book by Cardozo to understand how it is that judges restrain themselves and how they bind themselves uh, so that the law evolves in a principled way, in a grounded way, um, and not in a sort of freewheeling, arbitrary way. Um, and so uh, Cardozo is very much a, a hero of mine, uh, partly for that reason. Thank you.